I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Adrian, and welcome to today's podcast where we talk about my journey. I give you a little bit of a window into my path, which has been full of twists and turns to get to this point. I know very clearly what you're going through, what applicants, what students, what mature students, what mature applicants, what professional applicants are going through, because I have been through all of these various application and promotion processes. And I come to the table sharing my experience with you, informing our strategy with my experience. The twists and turns of my educational career path gave me the critical on the ground experience to do this work with you and to launch Apply Yourself the Advancement Spot. I'm going to be very honest with you in this episode about my experience. And I'll be honest that many people in my life don't even really know many of these twists and turns exist and certainly haven't had conversations with me about the different choices that I have made. And so this episode is really going to give you a solid understanding of why I do the work that I do in Apply Yourself. Let's start at the beginning. Undergrad. When I entered my undergraduate studies, I knew next to nothing about universities, about higher level education, and I really followed the path that many people follow into a life science undergrad, which was absolutely not for me. The reason that I followed the path into the life science program was because I thought I should probably go to medical school. It was what people around me were doing. I knew a lot of doctors and I thought, yeah, this seems, this seems right. But I got there and the content that I was learning in school was not aligned with what I enjoyed. And ultimately, the content that I was learning, the courses that I had to enroll in, were not aligned with the little whispers in life that were pushing me in a different direction. I'll give you an example of what I mean. When I was looking at the class calendar, the course calendar, I would pick my classes that I needed to take in the life science program, but I would flip very quickly to the global health program and look at how cool all those courses were. (laughs) So I really was not engaged in the life science courses. And the program that I was in was huge. To give you an example, my first year biology class had 3,000 students in it. We would all gather in the same lecture hall. 3,000 students is an unbelievable number. And when 3,000 other 17 and 18 year olds and some mature students were gathering in your class every single week, two or three times a week, you think that everyone is doing this. So it must be the right place to be. But there were whispers that I kept not identifying as whispers. Now I'm able to look back in hindsight and pick out all of the things that were going wrong. But in the moment, I wasn't able to pick those out. I was very dedicated to seeing through this program because when I make a choice, I stick to it and I try my hardest to succeed. But there were many things that were going wrong, as I said. First, the content just wasn't speaking to me. I was really interested in the macro level. I wasn't so much interested in the organic chemistry piece, in the microbiology. I was not interested in those things. And as I said, what I was interested in was the global health courses in the calendar that I kept flipping to thinking, oh, that would be so cool if I could learn that. Like, what what do I have to do to take that class? And the answer was switch programs. But do you think that I realized that at the time? Absolutely not. I was 17, straight out of high school, and it seemed like everyone around me was in some science program. So this is what I had to be doing. 
I had absolutely no idea that you could do something else. And this isn't the fault of anybody. It's just that often students do not know the options. The Receiving the course calendar is one thing, but when you've applied in high school to a specific program, you know, you apply in grade 12 to your undergraduate program. And then once you're in that program, once you're accepted, you're so excited, you've gotten into this amazing program, and then you have to pick your courses. And there are all of these requirements in first year, of course, as you all know. And all of these requirements were biology, chemistry, physics, All of these, by the way, were 3,000 person classes. So it seemed to me when I was 17, like everyone was doing it. And what was wrong with me that I wasn't getting it or that I didn't enjoy it? And this isn't to say that these topics aren't enjoyable. In fact, I've had to understand some aspects of biology and chemistry for my legal work. And so it's not that I don't see value in the content. I, of course, absolutely do. It just wasn't where I wanted to be spending my time and intellectual abilities. So I was hearing these whispers. And one of them was looking elsewhere for classes in the course calendar. Another one was that I had some bad experiences in the program that I was in. And it was really a function of just how competitive that program was. And I have seen what competition does to people productively, psychologically, and it is incredibly stressful and can bring out the absolute worst in people. And I'll give you one example. I was in a chemistry lab. The lab that we were doing that day was recrystallization. And if any of you out there have ever done this lab, you would know that it has a whole lot of steps for a first year lab. It, I think, had the longest set of procedures in any of the labs that semester. And what you do is you essentially try to create crystals in a test tube. And I had a question for the TA. So I walked away from my fume hood and I went to talk to the TA and I asked my question. I got my answer and I went back to the fume hood and all of my test tubes, all six test tubes were full of liquid. And so I looked at my fume hood partner and I said to her, hey, do you know what happened here? And she said, no, no, I have no idea. So I went back to the TA and I said, listen, I came to ask you a question. I came back to my fume hood and all of my test tubes are full of some sort of liquid. I don't know what it is. Can you just come take a look and help me figure this out? So the TA came over. She did some sort of pH testing and found out that it was hydrochloric acid, which is for those of you who don't know, a really strong acid. And basically my crystals were just burned and disintegrated. So we were now two hours into the lab And I had nothing to show for it. It was a three-hour lab. And so somehow I managed in the last hour to redo enough to get results and went home and wrote up my lab and everything. And and that was that. Now, it's not that a bad experience can dictate your life choices. In fact, bad experiences shouldn't shouldn't necessarily dictate your life choices. Of course, there are there are exceptions, but It wasn't this that dictated my choice. It was another whisper that I probably wasn't in the right place. So the experience of essentially sabotage in a chemistry lab was something that really got me thinking. As I said, you should never make rash, big decisions based on single experiences the majority of the time. But what it did was it helped me think. It helped me move one step closer to getting to where I needed to be. And I didn't know that this was happening at the time. I can only tell you about this because it's, I can't do fast math. It's a long time ago. (laughs) This has been a long time ago. And to give you a bit of a sense, I started undergrad in 2007. So this was back in the first semester, the fall semester of 2007. So as I said, this gave me sort of just something to think about. I finished off the year at this school in this program. And I wasn't enjoying the courses. I was doing okay, but I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. And I kept having this inclination that I wanted to be learning other things. I wanted, I was interested in other things. I was actually very clearly interested in the healthcare system, but I didn't actually know that that sort of program was available at any university. Forget about Toronto. I I just wasn't aware of the landscape and the educational landscape. So first year ended. And I began my summer job as a research student 
at Baycrest in a neuropsychology lab at the Rotman Research Institute with a team that I absolutely loved and with supervisors and colleagues that I have such fond memories of. I just had the the best time in my life. And this was this was where I was introduced to research. More on that later. So I had my summer research assistantship at Baycrest in the lab. And throughout the course of the summer, I was just really enjoying the research process. I was enjoying being in a health institution. And I had some really amazing peers during my time there. And we would talk a lot about trajectory, about about what programs they were in, what program I was in. And it was around the end of the summer or middle of the summer. And I had been speaking with my parents about what to do come the fall. Was I going to stay in my original undergrad program or was I going to switch? And my parents were telling me, maybe like, if you want to switch, that's totally fine. Like, let's just get the paperwork done. And I was so, so stubborn because I wanted to finish what I started and I didn't want to feel like a quitter. And so finally, I came to the realization on whatever day was the last day to switch to York University, which is where I went next. On the very, very last day that they were accepting applications to switch universities is when I called my mom and I said, so do you think that I could switch today? And so she came to pick me up from work and we drove all the way up to York. Much less was electronically done back then. And we drove all the way up to York and we met with the registrar and they said, what program do you want to or an academic advisor? And they said, what program are you interested in? And I said, biology. And they said, well, the biology door has closed. That deadline has passed. But do you like to write? And I thought, yeah, I do. I did really, I did well in my writing classes and I really like writing. So they said, how about this other program? It's called the Health and Society Program. And I told, cause I told them I was interested in health. And they said, what about the Health and Society Program? And I said to them, yeah, that sounds good. But can I also have the papers to reapply back into the biology program? So they gave me the papers that I needed and I enrolled in the health and society program and I just absolutely loved it. I filled out about half of the application to switch programs into biology and then it sat on my desk for the next year. I never applied to get back into biology and in undergrad, I found an amazing professor who I ended up working with on independent research studies for the next three years. And the work that we did was pharmaceutical policy regulation and fraud work. And this ultimately decided my trajectory for the rest of my journey. Now, I didn't know that that was happening at the time, but now looking back, I can absolutely see that there was a clear pull for me to be there call it the universe, call it whatever you want. I was meant to be there at that time. And we were doing work that I was absolutely enthralled in. And I was doing amazingly in all of my classes across the board. And it didn't feel like work. It felt like fun. I was learning and reading and curious. And I absolutely adored the work that I did in that program and the critical thinking and analysis skills that I gained in that program. Now, at the end of my undergrad career, around the third, at the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year, I spoke to the professor that I had been working very closely with. And I said, you know, I I still want to go back to med school. And she said, okay, I'll write you your reference letter. And I had some other people lined up for references. And I started the application process. I'm not even sure that many people in my life, not even made many of my friends even know that I applied to medical school way back then, but I went through the whole thing. I wrote the MCAT, I wrote my application, and I took, you know, whatever prep course I needed to in order to write the MCAT. And I went to somebody who was supposed to help with the application process. And I got there and they gave me a cookie cutter outline of what should be in the application. So I took it and, and everybody around me was doing this. So I, I took it. I went home. I wrote my application and I really wasn't resonating with the applications at all. I was loosely, you know, telling stories and providing, you know, examples of the content that the application was looking for. But because my 
trajectory was different, the application itself wasn't wasn't resonating with me. It wasn't in alignment with me. And I had an inkling that this was happening. And I spoke with that professor who absolutely changed my life. And I said, I'm also really interested in the work that we've been doing, the pharmaceutical policy regulation work that we've been doing. And she said, why don't you apply to this master's program and work with this professor who who's in that program? So I applied to my, I applied to the master's program as well, which ended up being my master's program. And I spoke with the professor who she directed me to, and I wanted to study there. So I wrote my personal statement for the master's program, and I took it back to that applications consultant as this person called themselves. And I said, would you mind reading it? I just want to know what you think. And this person said, no. They literally told me no. I had my application in hand. I was ready to pay them and they weren't cheap. And they literally turned me down and said no. I said, why? They said, well, you've applied to med school. Why would you apply to a master's? And I said, well, because I actually want to do this. And they said, no, you've applied to med school. You don't need to apply to here. So I took my personal statement home with me. I worked on it. I absolutely enjoyed the process of writing my application to my master's program. And Later on in the year, I received a letter from the one medical school that I would have wanted to go to, and I got rejected. And I remember sitting there thinking, I should be sad. And I thought to myself, so many other people are applying to these programs, and they would be just devastated if they received this rejection. But I don't feel sad. And it was in that moment, sitting there all alone, where I had this rejection letter sitting in front of me, that I realized this was not my path. So I put the letter to the side and I waited for the decision letter from the master's admissions committee from that program. And I got in and I was just thrilled because I couldn't wait to continue doing my research that I had started in my undergrad. So that program was the health policy and equity program in the graduate program in health at York University. I completed my master's and after my master's, where I focused on health policy and unethical industry marketing practices. And my master's thesis was on ghostwriting in medical journals. I then, after my master's, I applied to law school and I also applied to the PhD program. Now, I just want to pause here for a second because I didn't ever think about law school before this point. Before this point, it was medical school, medical school. Everything was pointing to medical school, except that everything wasn't. I had this idea that that's where I had to be, but of course life was pushing me. The universe was pushing me in other directions and I wasn't listening. I was volunteering at the time at Sunnybrook a Hospital here in Toronto and I was volunteering in the George Hees Veterans Residence, which is a long-term care residence for war veterans in Canada. And I was a volunteer in the recreational therapy department, which meant that I would go and essentially have fun with the vets. I would take them down to the dances that the rec therapy department was hosting. I would go to art classes, cooking classes with them, and I would just keep them company in their residence once or twice a week. And I did this for about five years, every single week for five years. And I'll never forget any of them. They had a huge impact on me. And one of them said to me, you're going to be a lawyer. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in my master's. I'm applying back to medical school. He said, trust me, you're going to be a lawyer. And I said to him, no, I'm not like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing my research. I, you know, I'm also applying to a PhD. Like I'm not applying to law school. Like I, why would I apply to law school? And he said, trust me, you're going to be a lawyer. And that was it for that day. And then I came back the next week. I saw him again. And he said, I really think you're going to be a lawyer. And I said, I don't think so. And he showed me a picture of his niece, who at the time was at Osgood, and he said, see, this is this is my niece. You're going to be a lawyer and she's going to be a lawyer. And I thought to myself, OK, like she's going to be a lawyer. That's great. But, you know, that's just not for me. So I said, OK, you know, thanks. And we kept doing the the activity that we were doing. And one day, really out of nowhere, I thought to myself, well, what does a lawyer do? Because I didn't really know any lawyers. There were some lawyers in my lives, but I had never really had conversations with them. And it was just so far out of my understanding of what people did because I hadn't really ever had a conversation with a lawyer. So I learned a little bit about what lawyers do. And I actually, that year, in order to understand more about what lawyers do, I applied to work 
as a research assistant at a law firm in downtown Toronto that worked in uh, medical malpractice, medical negligence. And this lawyer was working on pharmaceutical fraud cases. And it was in this position, it was in this moment that I had this realization that, oh my gosh, my research is actually completely related to his cases, to this lawyer's cases. And I already knew what his cases were arguing because of what I was finding in my research. And I, at the time, was looking at internal marketing documents that had been released as a result of lawsuits in the States. And it was in this moment that I thought, oh yeah, I could be a lawyer. I was involved in the day-to-day work for the firm and I was doing a lot of the writing for blog posts for the firm. So I applied to law school and I also applied to the PhD program at the same time. So the PhD program in health policy and equity. And I applied to both with an application that was absolutely aligned with my intellectual curiosity, with my values and with my goals. And I ended up getting into one of the law schools that I just wasn't all that interested in going to. It was a great school, but I didn't want to move away at that point in my life. Prior to this point, I might have been happy moving away, but at this point in my life, I didn't want to leave Toronto. So I ended up rejecting the offer to that law school and I was admitted to the PhD program. And I was one of four that was admitted in that PhD program. And one of the main reasons that I was able to be okay with the decision of turning down law school was that the PhD program cared about who I was and what my research was, what my goals were and what my values were. I really wanted to work with my supervisor and the committee that I chose and put together. And the opportunity just would not have been there had I gone to law school first and done the PhD second. So I opted to do the PhD first and I was successful in completing the PhD in four years by the time I was 26. I then reapplied to law schools and I was accepted into the school that I wanted to go to. I I, I went to Osgood Hall Law School in Toronto. And before I knew it, 12 years had passed since my first day of undergrad. I had my master's, I had my PhD, and I had my JD from Osgood. And the universe works in funny ways because while I was in classes as a student at Osgood, I was a professor in the next building in the School of Health Policy and Management, where I still am, and the School of Global Health. And so I was able to do this work all at the same time. Now, I never in a million years could have ever predicted that I would be doing this. And I'll just note that before my master's, I actually didn't even understand what a PhD was. So I knew that all of my professors had one and my TAs in classes were working on them, but I didn't actually know what it was until I got to my master's. So the point of this is that I don't want anyone listening to think that I that I always knew that I wanted a master's and then I was going to do a PhD and then I was going to go to law school. Absolutely not. It never in a million years happened like that. I didn't even know what a PhD was until I was exposed to it in my master's. And then I just absolutely had to do it. And I worked my behind off in order to finish it in four years. And along the way, I have made lifelong colleagues as a result of my research, which has functioned prominently in my legal work. And it also functioned prominently and and was identified very, very clearly in my law school applications as to why I wanted to be a lawyer and the type of lawyer that I wanted to be. And it is the type of work that I practice at my firm, Schneer Law and Policy Consulting. The work that I do in my law firm, the work that I do in my research, the work that I did in my PhD and my master's, it all makes so much sense now. And it all has contributed absolutely to the success that my firm has had and that my professional research has had. And my experience going through all of this allowed me to help people just like me in Apply Yourself who have had no idea what they want to do, figure out exactly what they want to do and how to get there. Along the way, I have made lifelong colleagues and amazing friends. I have published and I never thought I'd publish ever, ever. That was so out of the realm of what I knew. But once I did it, it was so much fun. And now I supervise graduate students and I take undergraduate students as research assistants with me so that they can start to publish early. 
I have been invited as a guest as a result of my research on CTV News and on tens and tens and tens of radio programs, both on AM, FM radio and on Sirius XM radio. I have given guest lectures and conferences at top universities and institutions in Canada and in the U.S., including U of T, McMaster, and Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and I'm absolutely loving everything I'm doing. I've served on admissions committees and promotions committees at the university and in job search and promotion committees. And so I understand how committees view applications. I understand the politics behind the scenes. I understand how applications are discussed and considered. And I understand why very clearly some applications are rejected very quickly and why others take more thought. I have also seen firsthand a lack of hands-on personalized support and coaching for students all through grad school applications and through career transitions and promotions, which are fraught with very, very political relationships and very, very carefully constructed and carried out strategy. Now, there are a lot of cookie cutter services out there that help you study for a standardized test and that may purport to help you write your applications. But students and young professionals need a holistic approach to applying to graduate schools, professional schools, and transitioning careers and achieving those promotions that you so deserve. We are about skills here at Apply Yourself because I know now that I had to develop skills that I now apply to you and that I teach you. And we use these skills and the skills development process so that you create the absolute best possible chance that you can have in the applications processes that you're engaging in. Now, we don't specialize in standardized testing, but we do work on skills development that is absolutely transferable across standardized testing. Remember, I wrote the MCAT and I wrote the LSAT. More on that in other podcasts later. And so I know the skills that need to be developed and I help you to develop those workable, actionable strategies that make sense for your life, your circumstances, your schedule. We coach you and we strategize with you to create a masterpiece of an application and to help you understand what needs to happen to revise it for other schools or programs. Now, let me just pause for a second and be clear. We do not write the application for you. That would be ghostwriting. And much of my academic research focuses on unethical practices like ghostwriting. Remember, application writing is skills-based. It's not intuitive. You were not born learning how to do this. You were not born knowing how to do this. I wasn't born knowing how to do this. I have developed these skills by helping a breadth of clients apply to all kinds of programs internationally. Application writing and advancement more generally is skills-based. It's not just floating through life, saying yes to things that you're not aligned with and applying to programs because other people think it's a good idea. Advancement is absolutely skills-based. It's intensely based in personal reflection, personal identification of what it is that you want and what it is that you want to do, and in understanding our weaknesses or our shortcomings and figuring out a path forward in spite of those and to build and grow through those experiences to make our weaknesses become strengths. And in so doing, we develop our character, we develop our skill, and we advance because we learn how to make the right choices for us in ways that value and serve us and our goals. Now, depending on how you choose to work with me, either in a half-day session or in our 90-day program, we work with you personally in order to make sure that the approach that you are taking is the best one for you and your circumstance. We make sure that you develop strategic, actionable, tangible steps forward, and we develop those with you. Especially if you enroll in our half-day program, you work one-on-one with me for the half-day where we develop those strategic, actionable, tangible steps forward. But if you work with me in our 90-day, we actually work through the steps with you through the entire application process to create, finalize, and submit an entire application package that you are 
proud of, and confident in, and that is strategic, personalized, and polished. I hope that giving you a window into my journey has revealed that no path is a straight line. And where it looks like something has been easy for somebody, it's likely that they haven't yet experienced the twists and turns that they're going to, or that we never know what's going on behind the scenes. I will say, though, that I remained thoughtful and analytical and still am throughout the entire journey. I always looked for opportunities, saying yes to as much as I possibly could that I felt aligned with and that always reflected my values and my goals. And I'm always reflecting, still always reflecting on my work, on opportunities, on my next steps and on growth and my own advancement. Remember, advancement is never done. Advancement is never done. We are lifelong learners. And that means that we embrace that life is always going to teach us. There's always going to be something that we haven't done. And sometimes that's uncomfortable, but we move through the discomfort. We feel that discomfort. We move through it and we let it help us grow. We don't shove it down. We don't bottle it up. We don't ignore it. We reflect in the moment and afterwards on what was so uncomfortable and why and how we can move forward with developing the skills that we need to in order to make whatever it was that was uncomfortable for us a strength that we have. I have always been analytical and reflective. I'm still this person now and I use my experience for you. Thanks for joining me today. I look forward to next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at applyyourselfglobal and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode leave this episode a review and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.